Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Continuing our study verse by verse, line by line. And um, because we believe this is the Word of God, so we want to take it seriously and take it, care, uh, be careful with it. And so we don't go at a quick speed, we just want to be thorough. So we'll be starting in verse 13. So Mark chapter 10, verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come today and look at your word, we pray that you would be honored and glorified. We pray that I would speak with clarity, and we pray that those who hear would seek to apply these principles to our lives so that we would not only be hearers, but also, more importantly, to be doers of the word. So we thank you again for this time. And we thank you for your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, I had a kind of a funny story the other day. I told my two-year-old, who's almost three, to clean up the room. And she replied, um, I don't know about that, was her response. And I, I thought, who is this person talking to me? I don't know about that. And um, so I reminded her of the consequences of not obeying, and she, she did obey at that point. And um, another thing happened recently with my older child, my five-year-old. And so I was trying to get her to jump into the pool. So we're, uh, since fall is here, we're trying to take advantage of that. Although you never know with the weather here. Um, but So our pool is closing Monday. We're swimming, and I, I said, just jump in. And so my child said, well, I, I can't do it. I, I don't know how to. And uh, if any of you have ever seen her up front, she's pretty good at jumping off the steps. So I said, you can do it. And she said, well, well, I'm afraid. And I said, well, it's okay. I'm here. If you fall, I'll catch you. It's okay. I mean, you're going to fall, but everything will be okay. I'm right here. And she just wouldn't do it. And I even tried to bribe her. And I said, hey, if you jump in, we can stay out longer. And she, uh, she still didn't do it. And so it, it was kind of an uh, interesting reminder for me that as kids grow, they, they get more wise in their own eyes. And uh, Especially the youth, you know, that a, a youth will think their parents don't know anything, and uh, they are the expert. And I know this because I teach the youth here at church. And then, you, you know, it's funny because as they get older and then they have their own kids, they realize that their, their parents actually knew some things. And so they try to tell their kids what to do, and, and their kids won't listen, right? And, and so it's this vicious cycle of uh, never learning. And so why do I bring this up? Well, you have a, I think a, that's a good picture of our text this morning, and that is the importance of uh, childlike faith, the importance of trusting in God, just as kids trust in their parents. And so I know, especially when my kids were younger, now they're getting older, so they're not trusting me as much. But, you know, you think about little kids, they're not concerned about whether or not you'll give them food or uh, they're not concerned about where or not they'll have shelter. I mean, they just trust us. And um, Although occasionally my oldest would, uh, <laughs> we would say, all right, it's time to go. And she would say, don't leave me, don't leave me, which is kind of weird. Like, have I ever left you before? So that's in a time where she didn't trust. But for the most part, um, our kids are, as they're young, they, they trust us. They just, uh, we're our parents. And so our, we are their parents. And, and that really is a great picture of salvation, of trusting in God. So we're going to look at that some this morning. So this account I just read is is probably familiar to all of you. And it's probably familiar, and it happens three times in the Bible. So in all the synoptic gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this account happens, and then right after it is the rich young ruler. So it's interesting to see the connection between the two. 
And so I'm going to talk about that in a moment, how those two are connected. But you have this all three times, and so you see its importance in the Bible. And you probably, guys are probably familiar with um, just the idea of Jesus saying, let the little children come to me. So you think about the previous context, our previous sermon, Jesus was talking about divorce and remarriage, and they were in a home, and they were talking about this. And this is probably in the same context. So after that had happened with the discussion about divorce and remarriage, and now they're talking about the children. So these children are coming to Christ. And so this morning, just a simple outline. I want to talk about um, how Jesus loves the children, the little children, all the little children of the world, right? Red and yellow, black and white. They're a precious insight. And then we're going to talk about how children give us a great picture of salvation. So those are our, our, two, th- our two thoughts for this morning. So verse 13. And they were bringing the children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We think about um, what, what's going on here. And why were they bringing kids to him? So this tense of bringing, is it, in the Greek, is it imperfect, which means it was just something they were doing. It wasn't a one-time thing, but they were just bringing the kids to Jesus. And for the purpose that he could touch them, he could lay his hands on them, that he could pray for them. And this would have been just a, a common tradition in those days for the Jewish people, to, for the parents to bring their children to the rabbi, for him to pray a prayer of blessing over them. So it's, today it would be similar to the, a baby dedication. So you think about what we do here, even at our church. The babies are brought forward, and the pastor will pray to God for the children, that they would grow and that one day maybe they would become, like, they would become Christians, that they would become more and more like Christ that they would grow in holiness. They, they pray, the pastor will pray for the parents um, as well. And so you have here just a, a similar parallel of uh, what we do today, and this is what was happening here. So they were bringing the children to Christ. And so the children here, uh, in Luke it says the infants, and here it just uses a, a generic term for children. So probably from infants up to age 11 or 12. So in the Jewish time, you, you don't really have the middle area you just have a kid and then an adult. And so for a girl at the age of 12, she would become an adult. And for the boy at the age of 13. So, so they're bringing these children to Jesus and to the rabbi. And it just shows, by the way, just the influence of Jesus as a rabbi. The fact that the Jewish people wanted to bring their kids to him. Um, you remember, Jesus wasn't officially trained like the other rabbis. And you know, it's funny, sometimes he would, well, oftentimes, he would just quote the law and then he would give an explanation. And that really threw people off because he wouldn't quote from other rabbis. He would just, since he wrote the law, he would explain it. So, anyways, um, so with Jesus then, he's a rabbi. They're bringing their kids. They have a high view of him. They, they respect him. And so they want him to pray over their children. They want him to pray a, a prayer of blessing over them. But as you see there in 13, it says that the disciples rebuke them. So as he's bringing these children to, as they're bringing the children to Jesus, his own disciples are stopping them. They're, they're rebuking him. And this was a, a very uh, harsh term here. It's very serious, the fact that they were rebuking these parents. I um, mean, it's kind of, I, I just thought about from our, in our day, like, if we're going to have a baby dedication and you're about to bring the kid up front and then one of the deacons is like, no, no, don't bring the kid up there, okay, don't do that. And that's just kind of a strange thing. And so why would the disciples rebuke them? And I think there's really probably two, two things. One, it would be a positive thing, just that they, they really, they're kids, you know, they didn't want these kids to inconvenience the master. So they wanted to bring keep them from coming. You know, Jesus had more important things to do. But the negative side of that is that they were snobs, okay? They were just, they were stuck up. They're, they weren't uh, showing a love for everyone. And so this is something that we see often in the Gospels with the disciples, how they'll, they'll either, they'll prevent, they'll try to prevent people from coming to Christ, or when he talks to certain people, they'll just be surprised. They'll 
they'll be like, you're talking with her? You're talking with this tax, this sinner, this Pharisee? And so you, you see that with the disciples, this kind of attitude. And then in this day, children just were not very important. I mean, not like today almost in our day. It's almost like they're worship. But back then, they were just part of family. It wasn't that big of a deal. So the disciples rebuked them. Now notice what, how Jesus responds in 14. It says, But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So you have then the disciples rebuking the parents, and now Jesus rebukes the disciples for rebuking them. So this is a, a serious, uh, serious language here. He says, let them come to me. Do not hinder them. So to let them come is that same tense where it's like, let them come continually. This is something we can do, and do not stop it. And he says, for to such belong the kingdom of God. So Jesus here when he sees this, it says he was indignant. So again, it's a, a very serious term. He was very angry at what he was seeing. It made him very upset. And I think this, this gives us for a moment a, a reminder that sometimes it's okay to be anger, angry. Righteous anger is okay. And we see it several times with Jesus. We see it when he's cleaning out the temple because you have these uh, merchants in there who are using the temple to exploit people. They're using God's house for their own monetary gain. And so you see him driving them out as one example. And there are many other examples where Jesus is angry. So there are times when anger is appropriate. It's a righteous anger. So I think when we think about it from our end, we can ask, is my anger on behalf of God? So am I angry because the holy God has been offended? Or is my anger selfishly motivated? And I think that's where, if we're honest, probably a 99 out of 100 times is selfish anger. So just think about the last time you're angry, and there's probably some selfishness involved there. And, but there are times where, like Jesus here, it is appropriate for us to be angry, righteously angry. So if you think about, for example, a, a false teacher who's who's saying, hey, give me money, and uh, God will make you rich, and you'll never be sick. You know, and they're saying that to people in Africa who are very poor. That's a good time to be angry. That's, that's righteous anger, because they're exploiting the poor. They're making God look bad. But I think we can say, at least for me, it's so easy to have selfish anger. But in this example, Jesus has righteous anger. And so he is angry at them. And why? Why is he angry? Well, I think there's a few reasons. One, Jesus loves, as I said, he loves the little children, okay? So um, Jesus made, um, Jesus is God, he made children. And, and children are made in the image of God just as adults. And so it's, it's easy to, um, especially as a parent, to forget that. You know, we get annoyed with our parents or, or with our children. We, we struggle with our children. And, and yet they are little humans. They're like us. And, and when they sin, it's not like we don't sin, too. When they're selfish, it's not like we're not selfish. But uh, children are a blessing, and they are a gift. And you have here just God's love for children. He loves the little children. And so this is one reason. Another reason was just that they were preventing uh, ministry opportunity. So another thing, God um, saves children. And that's why here at church, at Hickory Road, and in and many others, we have ministries for children. We want to minister to them. We never know when their time will come. Um, so we want to have a good ministry for the kids. And the disciples were preventing these children from coming to him. So a good thing not to do, don't prevent someone from coming to Christ or um, hearing about Christ. You know, I think about some of the parents who won't let their kids go to church and hear about Christ, and it's something Jesus doesn't like. So another reason, not only that he made children, he loves them, and that it, this was ministry opportunity, but I think just because of the disciples themselves and how they were acting, the, the, and I said it before, but uh, how they were being snobs, right? I mean, they were being 
stuck up. And, and you see this, unfortunately, often with the disciples. Just they, they were so quick to push people away. Um, remember the account with Jesus and the woman at the well. And when they saw him talking to her, it, it was shocking. Like, this guy is talking with this woman. And at the time, a rabbi wouldn't have done this, let alone not talk to a woman, but not talk to a Samaritan woman as well. And, and you just see here, with this example, you see how Jesus loves everyone. He loves the rich and the poor. Um, he loves the outcasts, uh, the needy. It doesn't matter the race or the color of their skin. Jesus is just, he loves everyone. And you see that here in the Bible. He, he often talks with tax collectors and, and uh, the Pharisees, the people that the Jews would never associate with. He talked with the Gentiles and then here with the children. So the disciples here, they're showing just this major negative in their thinking, a major flaw, and that is that the gospel or the kingdom of God is only for the elite, for the, the religious, and not for everyone. So the gospel here is for the poor and needy, not just for the wise and the popular. It's, it's for the Jew and the Greek. It's for the slave and the free. It's for everyone, no matter what class you're in, no matter what color your skin. And it, it's sad to think that uh, there are Christians, or so, so-called Christians out there who are racist in, in light of this, in light of the fact that the gospel is for everyone. There is no partiality with God. God looks at the heart. So here you see the Christ and his love for the children. And it really is a great reminder of God's love. So another thing we see here is God's, um, not only his love for the children, but how children picture salvation. So let's look at verse 14. He says, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So kind of an interesting uh, text here. And what is he saying? Well, I think what he's saying is that for those to be a member of the kingdom of God, or another way to say this, to be a Christian, you have to have a childlike faith. So our salvation is dependent on a childlike faith. Here's a helpful quote. It is total independence, is total and complete dependence and trust in Christ for salvation. God's kingdom is not gained by human achievement or merit. It must be received as God's gift through simple trust by those who acknowledge their inability to gain it any other way. We enter God's kingdom by faith like children, helpless, unable to save ourselves, totally dependent on the mercy and grace of God. We enjoy God's kingdom by faith, believing that the Father loves us and will care for our daily needs. What does a child do when he or she has a hurt or a problem? They take it to a father and mother. So what an example for us to follow in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So you think about that. You know, a child, they'll have a, a, this faith in their, <clears throat> their parents, this uh, absolute um, trust in them. And, you know, ideally the child would jump in the pool and they would trust their, their father, right? And that's how we need to be. We need to be trusting in God like a child. A total dependent, trusting spirit in him. So we're trusting in what Christ did and not what we do. So this, I think, is just a good time to take a minute and think about our own salvation. So, so we are saved, so from Ephesians, saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. So we are saved, it says, by grace. So what is grace? Well, grace is a free gift. It's, it's when we're given something that we don't deserve. When we, for example, when we give our kids things, they, they don't deserve it. They, they really don't. We just give it to them because we love them. It's a free gift. Um, they really don't deserve that. So it's grace. So our salvation is grace. It's a free gift. And we're saved by grace through faith. So it's faith in what Christ 
did on our behalf. So Christ, what did Christ do? Well, he lived a perfect life. Um, Christ, God, became man. He lived with us. He died for us. So you think about that. And think about that psalm we read at the very beginning. God Almighty, the All-Powerful, sent his Son as a human like us. He humbled himself. And he lived here on earth. He never sinned. And then he died on a cross. And he bore the wrath of God on our behalf. So, so we all sin. And the problem is when we sin, we deserve punishment. We, it's, it's a just thing for us to have punishment for our sin. And what Christ did is he bore that sin. That punishment we deserve, he bore on the cross. So we have faith then in what he did and his work, not in our own. And then it says, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. So it's a free gift. It's not based on what we do. It's based on what Christ did. And that way we won't be arrogant about it. We won't say, well, this is what I did because I'm such a good person. Or I did this or I did that and that's why I'm a Christian. But we are saved by grace through faith. And I want to clarify, when I say uh, childlike faith, I don't mean like a, a naive faith or a, like a faith in a sense that childs are, children are young and they don't really know much. Like our faith in the Bible and God is rooted in much evidence. It's not a blind faith, but it is a faith that is totally and absolutely dependent on God. It's dependent on him, not on what we've done. So it's an absolute reliance upon Christ. It is a total um, trust in Christ and not in us. And you think about like our world, and it's often said, well, like everything, you know, all religions are the same. They all lead to God. And in some sense, that's true. And all religions are the same. So like the, the ones that are not Christianity, they're all the same in the sense that they, um, the way to be saved is by being a good person, by doing good deeds, good works. And this is what truly makes Christianity different than every other religion. Because the way we are saved as Christians is not by our works, it's not by anything we do, it's by faith. Faith in what Christ did. So, so it's good to think about, you know, are all religions the same? Well, they do have different gods and different ways of attaining salvation. And definitely, Christianity is very exclusive. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And it's through faith in what Christ did. So when you think about then a childlike faith, is total and complete um, trust in the work of Christ, and not in our own works, not in our own efforts. So it's a free gift. So I mentioned at the beginning that at the end, after this story, the next account is the rich young ruler. And what you find when you read all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll have this account, let the little children come to me, followed by the rich young ruler. And it's interesting that all three happen, and these, they're all, every time they're mentioned together. So why is that? Well, we're going to find out next week. Pastor Brian is going to teach on that. But I'll give you a quick uh, summary of why. Uh, the rich young ruler was depending on himself. And you'll see that next time. That he was putting his faith and his trust and his own merit in what he was doing. He says, you know, I've done all these things from my youth. I have followed the law. And so he felt like because of his good works, he could be saved. And so I think that's why the two are put together. You have one example that's a childlike faith. It's a total trust in Christ. And the other example is a total trust in oneself. So you have in the little children story here, total reliance upon Christ. And then another aspect, which we'll see next time, from Pastor Brian, is a total surrender to Christ as well. <clears throat> so the rich young ruler, he says, you need to be, able, be willing to give up everything, everyone, to follow me. It's all in, total surrender 
for Christ. So I want to end just with a few uh, practical steps. I mean, when we think about this, we are talking about parenting. So this is for the parents. Number one, just questions to think about. Are you being an example? So are you a godly example to your kids, whether they're young or old? Are you being like Christ? Are you bringing your children to Christ? So let's get even more practical. Are you committed to a local church? Are you actively involved in serving in a church? Do you spend time daily reading the scripture and in prayer? Are you pursuing holiness? Are you trying to become more and more like Christ every day? So let's get more practical. Do you gossip and slander? Are you quick to anger? Are you quick to stress out instead of trusting in God? Are you consumed with the things of the world? Are you consumed with uh, pop culture or uh, money or your career? Or are you pursuing Christ and his glory above everything else? Are you all in for Christ? I like to describe it that way. A true Christian is one who's put everything on the line. We're totally surrendering all for Christ, for his glory. So when you think of this ex- uh, example here, we're reminded of God's love for the children. He, he's a loving God. He shows no partiality. And then we're reminded as well of how salvation is a picture, uh, uh, childlike faith is a picture of salvation. So the way children trust in their parents is the way we need to trust in Christ. Trusting in him, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything he has done. So it's a free gift. And you know that the word gospel, it just means good news. And that is good news, that salvation is a free gift, not based on anything we do, but on everything he did. And that's really amazing. So I want to end with just a familiar hymn. Um, you guys probably have heard it. It's called Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. And uh, you probably, if you're like me, you remember the first part and not anything else. But It's really good stuff. So uh, listen to the, the ending here. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let his little child come in. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. We'll invite you all to stand, and we're going to have a time of response now, but first we'll have a time to pray. So let's, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for these few verses, and we see why they are repeated so many times in the Gospels because they are so important. They remind us of your love for us. Not only the popular or the rich, but for the poor, the afflicted, the outcast. Not a love just for the Jew, but for a Jew and the Greek. For the Jew and for not Jew, everyone else. Lord, we're grateful for your love, which we see through you having sent your Son such great love. And then we're thankful for this picture of salvation, this reminder that our salvation is not by anything we do. It's totally all a work of Christ. And all we have to do is, like children, we have to put our faith and our trust in Christ. So we pray that if there's someone here who's not a Christian, that they will put their faith and their trust in you right now. We pray also for all of us who are Christians that we would continue to live for your glory. We pray this In your son's name, amen.